maybe I summarize the question and give you a quick answer. Um, when you try to understand what the role of a, f of a window is for the resolution or so, then of course one choice is to say I have a signal consisting of two pieces which are sitting at two frequencies. So musically, to, to, to move around here, it's like the Practically, I would just say, take, uh, I don't know, a few copies of the, uh, I don't know, 25th column of your full matrix, there's a pure frequency, put it in this line and then concatenate with another frequency. So uh, maybe with a zero behind or glue it together in, and on the torus or so. So what you would expect is the information, I have exactly this frequency at this moment and I have exactly the other frequency at the other moment. And then you can already just, without uh, doing mathematics, but just practically think, well, what if I choose a small window which has a few samples? Okay, that will say, I cannot say what the frequency is, three samples are not enough, so it's too short. <laughs> so let's take, I don't know, 100 samples or so, then I can say, if the frequency is high enough, I see three oscillations in within my window, I recompute the frequency, or I really can compute it, it will show something, but not very clear. It's somehow between 400 and 500 hertz or so. It will be, usually, um, yeah, I, I would take a chalk, uh, here I cannot do it, but I would kind of mark on the blackboard a stripe, which is showing some uncertainty. <laughs> and then I'm going to the new position, because my window is quite short, I can move that window keeping the orientation and I can move on. So you would say the spectrogram is smeared in frequency but the time of the jump, the transition is relatively clear. Mm. Now this is kind of unit length and I have to keep that and move, the, keep in that signal that somewhere. So if I take a long window, it's more like this. I'm trying to draw a line now and I'm taking a draw line. And then I'm getting in the region where I have already 25% of the second frequency within the domain and that where the frequency, the, the time domain will be smeared and so and I can move it down and I will move it again. So in that case, in those parts where for a long enough time you have a clear frequency or maybe several frequencies, you really see the lines and that's what the carburetor is doing. You identify the key frequencies and that's how the labels are generated. But that the moment when you have sudden abrupt changes is not possible. That's also quite clear. I mean, in a practical life, it's, uh, and that's again maybe a wor versus story. When I was a young assistant, uh, I had learned about Fourier series expansion and that we shouldn't worry about the, the period because either it's one or two pi, or actually if it's gamma, I will stretch it to a unit vector, whatever I, I would have. And there was a colleague coming from, uh, from chemistry and she, she said, well, my advisor gave me some data and I'm supposed to find out the frequencies. So you have a piece of something which is a superposition of certain frequencies, but you don't know the periodicity because you have only a piece. So what can you do? I mean, in the worst case, you're saying I'm cutting out this piece, or let's say in the lucky case, you would say you have exactly 10 full periods and everything is fine and you have a peak at, at, at uh, coordinate number 11 because you start counting frequencies from 0, 1, 2, two up to 10. Okay. But if the ends don't fit, and that's kind of the worst thing that can happen, you have 10 and a half periods and if you would have chosen the right window length everything would have been fine, but in this way you have a function which has a jump and you glue it together and the jump function creates not even summable Fourier coefficients but even worse only L2 coefficients. So uh, this problem of ends which do not fit while we also had something similar problem I can tell you in private about image processing. We wanted to find sub-pixel shifts and it didn't work. It was working fine in the, in the, in the synthetic case where we produced these sub-pixel shifts <coughs> and it didn't work in the real image until we realized we tried to find, use FFT methods to find a sh uh, shift in the picture. But once we move a picture by one pixel and if we do it as if it was circular and we are comparing the last column with the first column and that's certainly usually very different so one has to do the windowing but that's uh, essentially a different story yeah so claim is again if you have no other a priori information and if you are stuck with one window then you have to be careful with any claim and certainly you cannot compose music by saying I'm making a nice painting where every pixel is 
uh, described independently because the space of all pixel images is n-dimensional. And what we see already from this equation here in the second line, uh, Plancherel tells us that we have what is called Moyal's identity. I've uh, forgotten to mention this. So Moyal is exactly the second equation. So this non-preserving. It tells you in a discrete setting where we do MATLAB, I'm going from the n-dimensional space of signals into the n-squared dimensional space of all possible images. So clearly, most of the images are actually not OK. And the interesting thing will be actually to say, if you have a mapping from a, a low dimensional space into a high dimensional space, no, I forgot. To <coughs> it's an isometric mapping. So if you have R2 and you map it into R3, angles are preserved, lengths are preserved. And then you can ask, well, how can I get back? What is the inverse mapping? And the answer is, it is just a joint mapping. Because isometric mapping has the property that ux with ux equals length of xx, so it's identity. So if ux with ux color product is equal to identity, you can also move that first u over to this. So you can say x is the same as u prime ux. This is true for every x. You have seen the polarization equation. Then you have y with u, u star, u star u x equals y with x. So if this is true for every y, it means the two are the same. So <coughs> u star u with x is identity of x. So that is what I'm saying. You're <coughs> having something isometric <coughs> from a small Hilbert space to a large Hilbert space. Therefore, the adjoint of the mapping, uh, which moves from low to from little Hilbert space of signals of maybe nasty objects into the large space of smooth images, is inverted by taking the synthesis. This is a relatively formal argument, but it will help us also to, do, to show the recovery. So the lower part is just the story I told you. We have energy preservation, or we can say that for normalized signals, this picture will show you a probability distribution of where you can expect more um, information. Again, because it's not at individual points, it's not meaningful, but in, you can say in regions. It also means, uh, and th that's maybe another good, uh, good effect why these systems are OK. If you have s uh, found that uh, there's a certain noise level, and you are finding out that your improvement by cleaning up the picture, really meaning small values are put to zero, and um, coefficients at places which shouldn't be there because there was ambient noise or so are removed, if you are in removing 20% of the, of the energy in the, in the spectral domain, or in, the, in the phase space domain, then it will also mean that you have removed more or less 20% of the original energy. That's a big difference compared to, let's say, very badly, badly conditioned frames like irregular GABA frames, or GABA frames with, with a not well-chosen window or so. There you might say, oh, I'm happy I have removed 30% of noise. But maybe the signal was such that for this signal, the ratio of noise and the assignment was completely bad. So you've just removed 10% <coughs> of the noise if you go back to the signal domain. So it's very nice to say fractions of energy from an overall signal are visible and measurable in the domain. And you can imagine that if you have a frame which is close to a tight frame, that's just terminology now. Uh, for a little while, they were called snug frames. So I think it's kind of nice and almost tight. Uh, there is no big difference. I mean, you have maybe uh, a slight factor 0 0.9 to 0 0.1, and, but still you can say I have removed a large part or a small part. Okay, now uh, I think the next part is already making use of this, and I will try to tell you in an abstract way. You see in the first line uh, the repetition of my statement that if uh, a mapping from a Hilbert space H1 to Hilbert space H2 is Length preserving, then you have this, and that was my, my argument without using symbols. And now the question is, what is uh, the, the adjoint mapping? Again, it's very simple, not simple, it's very good to go back to the situation of matrices. So if you think you have a matrix, we have also repeated this viewpoint, then matrix vector multiplication is taking linear combinations. So it's the matrix which moves the vector from one space to another vector. 
but I prefer to think, sometimes at least, to say no, the vector decides how much of these linear, of these columns of the matrix are used. X1 times the first column, X2 times the second column. So matrix vector multiplication is a linear combination machine. Now you can say if you have a matrix, the tr the, there's an abstract uh, a joint operator which is the transpose conjugate matrix, which is in a MATLAB it's A prime. So if you come with a system of vectors, of column vectors, you have transpose it, conjugate, and then you do this matrix vector multiplication of the transpose conjug. And then it's good to think of what is now happening with my first column. The first column is in the conjugate position as a row vector, and matrix multiplication gives me not just a matrix product, but it gives me the scalar product. I have x1 with y1 conjugate, x2 with y2 conjugate. So it's a scalar product. So again, the viewpoint is a matrix is a collection of column vectors. Multiplying with the matrix is doing linear combinations. Um, multiplying with the transpose conjugate is producing all the scalar products of my given vector with all these vectors. And we have seen that <coughs> unitary matrices are so good because uh, then it's clear you get u prime u is identity. We would say that's clear because uh, uh, we have learned the definition of unitarity. But it's also clear that if you have n vectors in an n-dimensional space, then have knowing that u prime u or that u u prime is identity means it's the inverse matrix. And one story is to say, I use it as an inverse, so you give me the linear combination. I want to find the coefficients. I apply the inverse, so I take scalar products. That's one rule. The other way is, how do you know that it's such a nice matrix? A priori has almost nothing to do. I mean, you're talking about angles, and you say somebody tells you 90 degrees is so fine. So, okay, I'm having, why are these nice systems with rectangles, <coughs> right angles are so nice? Because if I take these vectors and put them in a matrix, and I'm writing the other matrix here, and I can compute u prime with u, I'm taking all the possible scalar products. I'm getting one when the number is equal, which is the main diagonal of the unit matrix, and I'm getting zero elsewhere. So the two conditions, u u prime identity and u prime u identity are having two different meanings. One is orthogonality, and the other is representation of all the vectors. And now the good thing is, which even if you do Gabor analysis or so is, you're maybe you learn that, uh, that this expansion of these vectors is okay when you have an autonomous system. Or you say, maybe when can you expand every vector in an autonomous system? Well, if the autonomous, autonomous system is complete. And then you forget that the assumption of the statement is if you have an autonomous system, then it's complete, meaning you can represent every vector, not only the one in the linear span, if you have a certain property. But if somebody says, if I have a system of vectors which allows you to use it in this naive way, I take coefficients with, with respect to these vectors, and then I, I, um, I take a linear combination. So in, in my terminology it would be, you come with a vector, I have my collection of vectors, I take scalar products, so I multiply with A prime, and then I multiply with A. What I'm doing actually is I take a collection of scalar products. Five vectors give me five scalar products. I do matrix multiplication with the same matrix. I'm doing linear combination. So my way of describing what is the frame operator in the standard terminology is I try to see maybe the frame expansion works. And I even don't care about the number of vectors. Somebody is giving me 20 vectors. I just try it. And then I observe, of course, if, um, if this operator is good, meaning invertible, then maybe I can get an, a true representation by applying the inverse of this operator. And if I have no chance, if <coughs> some vectors are not represented, if the vector is not invertible, then I will really have a problem because then my matrix is not having enough vectors. I am not having a matrix which, which spans. So somehow, this is also a nice, good exercise in linear algebra. When is, have a a when is a matrix having a left or a right inverse? Uh, and again, you come, of course, to the basic notions of linear algebra, linear dependence or uh, linear independence. And uh, the necessary part is explained in three sentences. That's why I do it now. When is a system not linear independent? Of course, 
when you have a linear combination of a non-trivial vector which is resulting in zero. So A has a non-trivial null space. So if I apply A prime to null, it will stay null. So clearly, if the Gram matrix, which is A prime with A, is um, invertible, then this will system will be linear independent. This is the easy part, and the other part is actually not different. So if the matrix has a right in, uh, left inverse, if you, you're looking from this side, then the columns must be linear independent. <coughs> now you choose the order and do it in the opposite direction. If it has a, 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 a now from your side, the right inverse, I have to think twice. <laughs> if you have a right inverse, then the vector must be surjective. Why? Because if you have a right inverse, it's, it makes matrix multiplication. But I'm saying, no, no, you're computing the right number of coefficients by something that I don't know. But if you are able to tell me that if I choose these coefficients, my matrix will allow me to represent your vector, then the vector must have columns which are representing everything. So that's really a nice uh, way of collecting these things. When somebody tells you you have this vector which is generating this, then there are right inverse and vice versa. And then you can go into the discussion again without f equations or so of saying, well, but maybe there are good solutions and bad solutions. I have a choice. What is the cost of the coefficients that you're giving me? Can you give me the cheapest ones? Cheapest are the minimal norm. And then you're saying, okay, generating system always has a solution for the minimal norm least square solution because everything is in the range. But among all the possible solutions, there's one that you can get for free. I mean, for you can get mm. numerically. That's in MATLAB, it's the pseudo inverse. In theory, it's the more penrose inverse or so in, in daily life it's the cheapest solution for your problem and every right hand side can be solved so that's essentially what you do so now we have seen what is the spectrogram and my explanation was i have the sensor i have an element in the hilbert space which is moved around so all these g lambdas at different positions are well they're elements of hilbert space but that takes color products so i think they are functionals so i'm taking measurements so if it would be finitely many, I would say, OK, write all these Gabor vectors in one big matrix. They are column vectors of a matrix. And what I'm doing, I multiply with the transpose. So what is now the, the opposite of, of taking scalar products? Synthesis. So the only thing I'm doing now, I'm writing VG. That's the symbol with a star. And that's the joint operation. And we're talking about Hilbert spaces and so. But somebody is giving me an energy distribution over phase space. Think of one-dimensional audio signals, and then these one and Rd cross Rd is time direction, frequency direction. Already for image processing, you have to think this is something four-dimensional now. So not so easy to, to do. But MATLAB fortunately allows four-dimensional matrices. So you can write everything in coordinate number. At this position, at this wave number, you have some value. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's quite OK. And now the opposite of matrix multiplication with continuous variables, you integrate. This here, and this is again my G lambda. So you're doing kind of matrix multiplication. You're doing synthesis. Of course, you have to be careful with the meaning of, of these things. So usually, that's the, the standard st statement that you have in these circumstances. I think 95% all the talks I've heard about th this theory, people saying this has to be understood in the weak sense. And uh, I'm not sure. I think now I will not have it. Oh yeah, here I have something. Uh, we are well prepared now to compare this representation with the, with, the, uh, with the classical representation. So remember once more, in the ordinary Fourier theory, you had Planchard theorem. And it was giving an isometric isomorphism of L2 of times into L2 of frequency. It's actually surjective. There is no orthogonal complement. Now we are having the small Hilbert space of L2 of signals going into L2 space of smooth versions, but that's, that's one of big difference. But otherwise, uh, it's always an <coughs> integral over a continuous domain. And here I write the Fourier inversion formula in a slightly sloppy way, as engineers and, and people in theoretical physics would do. And it's not meaningless, but it's to, it has to be taken with. What is the Fourier transform? Well, this continuous orthonormal basis, which is not an orthonormal basis, but is a continuous labeled system of pure frequencies that contains all the informations that we have, uh, has to be taken in this color product. And we know this is not good. We should first take L1. But 
formally for good functions. This is a scalar product. That's why we have the e to the 2 pi i conjugate, which is the e to the minus. So we are doing Fourier analysis. We're searching what are the frequencies in the signal. And once we know what the frequencies are that we have found, we're doing synthesis, and that's an integral. So somehow this is what we do. And I mentioned already, bad thing is, this is not even well defined for arbitrary elements in the Hilbert space because these elements are not in the Hilbert space, so you have L1 here. Now then this is a function, it's in C0, but not in L1. Fourier inversion requires to come back to give all this a meaning, but we know that if we do it carefully, we can extend it in a more abstract way, so somehow it's not so bad. And then for a long time we really were saying, okay, but the situation is much better because now these are nice spilling blocks. We have a bump function, it's in all, even in all the Sobolev spaces or so all the weighted L2 space with polynomial weights are great. So we can take Riemannian sums. Well, it's true, all these Riemannian sums are not just step function or so, uh, but they are decent, nice, nice functions. They are linear combinations of time frequency shifted Gaussians, for example, and they are Schwartz <laughs> functions. So can we prove that it's convergent? And that was really, I mean, I have now uh, these uh, several arguments and I can give you a very abstract one. And the very abstract one is essentially that I would say, well, for me, this is Lebesgue measure. And what is, how can I approximate the Lebesgue measure? Uh, I would say, give me a Riemann sum, which is fine enough. And probably this guy here, which is actually true, is concentrated mostly on a big, square domain, so I take a big rectangle, make a fine grid, and I compute these things, and I can say it's actually not important. I have some weak star approximation of the, of the, of the Lebesgue measure. And now the only thing is I have to use the Wiener algebra below because the constant one is not at in the dual space of, uh, of, of, uh, of C0, of course. It's not a bounded measure, it's an unbounded measure. But in some way, I, can, I could do it abstractly so that uh, I could say if you make it finer and finer, but Ferenc Weiss, he's a really expert in classical Fourier analysis, was with me at that time and we had a discussion and he was doing all the details. So you can read in his papers that you can really form that kind of Riemannian sums in the very natural sense. Take fine grids of a large enough rectangular domains and uh, this net, so you can say, no, I want to have a big, very long rectangle or so. I'm saying as long as you're using the essential coefficients for the given f, I know where most of the energy is concentrated because everything is smooth, you are close enough in the L2 sense. So that's again something where I would say if you take the Gauss function if you're, or if you're taking uh, any Schwartz function, and later on we will say you take any function in S0, you can prove that these Riemannian sums are really convergent, so partial sums are okay. Uh, what is not in S0 is what one should not use anyway, discontinuous functions, so step functions, even the box function is already bad, or because the space is Fourier invariant, everything which is on the Fourier transform of this a sink function, it's not integrable, it's not decaying, then you may have <coughs> problems with the tails and if you may be cut off at bad points, you may be un unhappy or so. So kind of that's something I would not think a very exciting uh, problem, but I think one could find a situation where you do this whole game in the weak sense in L2, so you do coordinate wise, you're saying this color product of H with F is this, you compute it by taking the scalar products of this. You see then you have scalar product of H with G lambda, which by conjugation is again uh, uh, another, well no, if, sorry, F with H on the right hand side. It's G lambda with H, so you flip it and you have a conjugate, so you have something which by the original definition, this is L2, that one will be L2, cauchy schwarz gives you, this integral makes sense. So you could, in the weak sense, it's always work, working. Uh, but it might be that if you try ordinary Riemannian sums and try to have convergence for nasty L2 functions and nasty windows, this combination should be avoided. But no engineer nor applied person would use, uh, I don't know, a rectangular function for local analysis because then you have all these unnecessary coefficients which come from cutting down and taking. Okay, so we have a very nice situation. And uh, now really comes I would say the elegant and, and um, no, yeah, the way how 
finally we decided to introduce the space and also I think it's also introduced in this way in, in Charlie Grechenik's book or so. Uh, there is the recent, very recent paper of Mats Jakobsen, who is my academic grandchild. So he was getting again interested in the subject because he, he was essentially in interested in the space because he likes to work on general locally compact abelian groups. And uh, somehow I see the situation that I always had this in mind and uh, in my head most of the results were kind of valid because I didn't go into all the details or so. And then he was asking me, where can you read about this? And it turned out, no, well, I didn't really write up all the things. I had written in, in, in the very early papers I've, I've worked in this setting. Then people didn't care about this, so I tried to make it more, more realistic. So I was going to RD. That's where more or less this characterization came up. It was useful for time frequency analysis. It was useful for various other things. And I'm still continuing to collect possible applications or so. But then we found out, well, if you do the functional analysis careful, in the general locally compact abelian group, you do not have lattices all the time. So you normally would say Wien algebra is nice. You take a partition of unity and you take uh, some lattice, which is good enough or so. Okay, let's do it in a group. You always think there's a group. There must be a lattice like set n in, in Rn or so. No, there is a problem with this. So if you have no Gauss function, you have no dilation, no lattices, you have to be very careful. And then there were other functional analytical aspects where really I was saying, I think I need only bounded functions uh, for, for this argument or so. And suddenly we're in the middle of discussion. Well, if you have a bound, if you have the topology of a weak star convergence on bounded sets, is it the same as the convergence, weak star convergence without the boundedness condition? If you're discussing with nets, can you replace nets by sequences? Well, probably yes, because the Banach space is separable. So these were really, like I would say, deep functional and analytic discussions where I was learning something. And of course, he was also learning how to work with these spaces. Or so this is now a paper which uh, will come out. So it's in the archive. You can find it already. Or you can find, so to say, the full theory of, 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 of uh, abelian groups. And what I try to do nowadays is in between. I mean, R in Rn, how you can introduce it easily. Uh, but it also has the feature of being very general. Now, uh, in the discussion about how should one have the definition of the space, we were really saying, well, what are, let's say, I don't know, the most in interesting 20 properties that uh, you would like to have for the space? And uh, what are the, let's say, the five possible approaches? And the question was, my, my way of working with it, frankly speaking, was I was saying, well, I can have so many, I know so many different characterizations. So kind of you would give me a number problem and say, okay, Inverse of 4 over 3 is four, 3 over 4. This representation is better. Uh, assume I was in number theory. You give me some number. So, oh, it's a good continued fraction. I use continued fraction methods, and I solve the problem this way. You give me another problem. Say, oh, it's a decimal. I use my, my laptop and compute the number in this way. But then the impression was you have to know all these representations to get to understand the space, and that's not true. And so we were deciding that this is the approach where most of the interesting properties go come in very quickly. And then you need maybe two, three other questions which are, are derived from it. And so I think with three or four characterizations, <coughs> you can do most of the things which are interesting in this subject. So OK, uh, since the spectrogram is very intuitive and also bringing us into time frequency analysis, this definition seems to be quite OK. We have seen that this function, this short-term Fourier transform, and especially the Gauss function, is a good candidate because you have already even computed its Fourier invariant. This function is bounded, continuous, and square integrable. So why is a bounded continuous function square integrable? So for example, why is 1 over x square integrable from 1 to minus, inf to in minus infinity? It's not decaying well enough, but it has a lot of small values. So if you square it, the small values will get even smaller. And by squaring it, it will be small enough. If somebody asks, is 1 over x integrable, then it's not good enough. So if a function has very bad distribution, and that's a good, good exercise or so, uh, what are the functions which have small l2 norm but large l1 norm? Or better, what are the functions which have L1 norm equal to 1, but a very small L2 norm? And then you say, well, the, the easiest way to understand what happens is, well, L2 is larger than L1. So 
go further, go to the infinity norm. What are functions which have a huge, uh, well, which have a one norm one, but a very tiny L infinity norm? Then it's clear you would say, I take my ST row operator, I have the box function, area one, and we know it's area preserving. You make it broader and broader, area 100, amplitude 100. What is the L2 norm now? Let's compute this for uh, on the fly. Its length if the interval is 100, value is uh, one hundredths of one. So I, I compute first the, the, the L2 norm of a, of a box function of length 100. It's one integrated over interval of length 100, then taking squared, it's 10. But the amplitude actually is 100. So the L2 norm is one over 100 times 10 is one over 10. So by stretching by the amount of, of 100, uh, my, my um, L2 norm is smaller by the square root of. So kind of the normalization of the dilation operator would be different from the one in L2. And it and small and tiny function, like signals which have a lot of energy spread out, not well concentrated, they're the guys who may be lucky to be in the L2 space, but not in that space. And these are the very badly concentrated, and the sync function is exactly one of the guys. It has L2 behavior in the, in the slow direction, which is like 1 over x. And therefore, if you take a strip of this function, <coughs> it will be not integrable, and therefore it's not in the, in the space. The other thing is, and why I, uh, I think it's, it's a very, very natural thing, and especially since we have already explained to it, uh, we have this reconstruction formula here. So for every f, we have this. Uh, and especially now, if this f is our VGF, so it's the short-term Fourier transform of this, if this is not only L2, then you have this Planchereel type inversion. But if this is L1, then I just put it over here and say f lambda d lambda, or VG little f d lambda, that's a bounded measure. So guess what you can do uh, in order to reconstruct it. And then we are more or less again by this discretized version of this. I just have to take my building block and then I do these sums and try to take the limit. And this abstract theory with the rho action or so, now I have to say rho of x and omega is, or, or, or yeah, x and omega, this lambda, is a time frequency shift operator. Uh, are the time frequency shifts operator, let's say, on an LP space, Isometric, clear. Area doesn't change if you shift it. Area doesn't change. Um, I mean, absolute area doesn't. Absolute value do not change if you multiply with the phase factor. So they're isometric. Are they depending continuously? Okay, you change a little bit the shift parameter, a little bit modulation. No problem. It's like the continuity of the short term uh, of the Fourier transform. I mean, you are watching everything on the compact set, and characters, frequencies converge uniformly on compact sets. So that's not a problem. Is it a representation? That's the most interesting thing. So do we have this law uh, that we had before? Rho of lambda 1 now composed with rho of lambda 2 is a rho of lambda 1 plus lambda 2. So we are saying the phase space, the time frequency plane is the real line times real plane, and so its addition would be the natural thing. You look, look at the spectrograms and you think it's OK. You say, what is the spectrogram of a function? Actually, I I'm, I'm can now already explain in terms of pictures why this space is isometric translation invariant in the time frequency spirit. So I'm telling you, <coughs> you have a piece of music, but then you have a repetition of the same part, and it's here. What will be the zero norm of this part compared to this one? Well, you integrate, and you have a shift parameter, it doesn't <coughs> change. Then you say, it was not the right tuning. I was shifting it in frequency. Let's play it at higher tone. I mean, same speed, higher tone. It's a bit a tricky thing. Uh, but of course, it's the same. So it's time frequency if shift invariant space. And uh, so you would expect it looks like composing two such things will have the same effect. What you don't see is the phase factors. Uh, because you have a time frequency, time frequency shift. So the order is not good. We have Again, time, frequency, time. And you would like have time, time, frequency, frequency. So time, frequency, time, flip. The inner two have to fl be flipped. And we know 
That means this was a frequency shift combined with a uh, time shift, or maybe in the other order. That means I have a multiplication with a frequency factor. They are giving only a phase factor, but they give a phase factor. So we have something which is called a projective representation. So the combination of two operators with their group parameters. So it's really, you can say, the abelian group of g cross g hat, dual group times dual group, is represented, but not in the sense of the exact group, but up to phase factors. These phase factors are having themselves some na very natural structure, but at the end, w it, there will not be a, a problem for our business. So mostly because we are doing projections onto these things, maybe if you look here, What we really will do, if this g is normalized, then f g lambda g lambda is really the projection onto the individual atom. They all have norm 1, so it's really orthogonal projection of the signal onto the atom in this place, and this place, and this place. And uh, if somebody tells you, I don't like your complex vector, I have multiplied everything with i, or with minus 1, or any, then you have that phase factor inside and outside. Inside, it's pulled out as a conjugate from the second component. Complex number times conjugate is, is one. So it, it doesn't change the question of how can you represent things, and therefore it's not really bad. But on the other hand, it's very important also actually for practical applications in audio or so that you have these phase factors. You have to be a little bit careful. But for this statement that I can represent this, so for me, it's really this is the integrated representation again. Under the assumption that I had in red with integrability, this can be read as a density, and I can really discretize it, and the discrete versions will converge to this. Whatever they are, you can choose it, and you can take ordinary Riemann sums. And the phase factors are in the same, I mean, they decide about the level of fineness that you need in your Riemannian sum, because they also change from place to place. So the estimates are not, not trivial or so, uh, but in terms of they are well defined, or so there's no problem. Okay, so. That that's one of the things that I wanted to mention. Now, since under again under this condition, every discretized version of our measure is giving you something which is convergent, just as a sum of time frequency shift versions of this, you get another very good property that I'm not sure if I uh, maybe I, I just try to keep talking about this in in a general way. It, uh, we can use it to show that uh, this space is the smallest among all Banach spaces of functions, let's say inside L1 with Fourier algebra, you know we have my pictures, it must be inside the Fourier algebra, it must be inside L1, but it's the smallest space which has this isometric invariance property. And somehow the, the vague argument would be, well, if we take the Gauss function, I mean the Gauss function should be real in all the spaces. Uh, in my setting, I would say the standard spaces, they all contain all the Schwartz elements or so. The Gauss function is the best among all Schwartz spaces, so that should be in the space. Now, if you're having a Banach space where time frequency shift is convergent, then all these partial sums that approximate in the reconstruction process my function will be in the same space and I can control the norm because I control the total mass of my distribution, which is the norm of my function space. And therefore, uh, just the way how I reconstruct my function from its short-term Fourier transform tells me that the convergence takes place in every reasonable function space. So as long as the time frequency shifts are isometric, I'm having a good business. Now, uh, the next thing is, and that was my way of proving Fourier invariance. So I was already smelling that if it's having such a minimality property, it should be Fourier invariant. Because if somebody tells me he has a space which is time frequency shift invariant, and I know the rules, and you know it um, also, that a time frequency shift goes into frequency time shift, but that's up to phase factors at time frequency shift. Uh, so the family of time frequency shift invariant standard spaces, that would be my terminology nowadays, this is a Fourier invariant family. For every space that you have, there's another space which is having the same properties, just as an exercise. You know the LP spaces, and they're important. Okay. Uh, but you can think of 
all the tempered distributions which arise as Fourier transform for any LP space. My terminology is FLP. You give me a symbol, I rotate it by 90 degrees, that's my, my, my game, so to say. What's happening? The kernel, the Schwartz space is invariant, therefore it's still inside. I'm living within the tempered distribution, that's why I can define the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform is injective, so I can always say it's exactly these things. What kind of norm should I choose? Well, I have a norm on LP, I take it with me. So I'm measuring on the space of all the Fourier transform in the sense of tempered distributions, functions in elem no, functions not elements in FLP via inverse Fourier transform, and that must be an LP, and that's in the measured in the LP. Is this a norm with this time frequency shift invariant? Well, I do a time shift of an FLP function, and you would say, well, he's doing a frequency shift on the other side. And so it's really completely symmetric. So if somebody has a family of spaces which is invariant under any operation, and you take the intersection, because if you have really a, 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 the smallest element is something which happens to be belong to the family, and it is in a, then it, this must be invariant. So the non-trivial fact is that the intersection of the whole family is a Banach space. And we had this other situation, I mentioned the example with the Siegel algebras, if you take Siegel algebras on the torus, so you take function spaces on, this, on the unit circle, then they are a Siegel algebra more or less, meaning you have a certain sequence space on the Fourier transform side. And I was mentioning that the intersection of all these Siegel algebra viewed on the Fourier transform side is the set of all finite sequences. Or going back, intersection of all Siegel algebras on the torus is the set of trigonometric polynomials. You never can turn this into a into a, a Banach space. So what is the difference that, that I was making here? I was arguing that I need uh, not only uh, this L1 property, but I also need multiplication with characters. So what is now, how can I show you what the whole story gives in the torus case? So as zero can be defined for any locally compact abelian group, so we should maybe try to see what happens in the torus case. So if somebody is telling me he has a non-trivial function space, then uh, I can of course multiply with arbitrary nice functions. For example, I could hope that there is at least one frequency which is in the function space. One frequency in the function space means I'm convolving with that frequency. I will say, okay, on the Fourier transform side, I'm co multiplying pointwise with a unit vector. So there's at least one unit vector which after scaling is in my space. Now I'm saying, but I know that uh, the space by assumption is translation invariant on the level of Fourier coefficients because it's modulation invariant. All modul time <coughs> frequency shifts are supposed to be asymmetric. So if there's one unit vector in the space, all the other unit vectors, because they are shifted versions of, the, of that one, must be in the space, they must be okay. So somebody tells you here's a Banach space of sequences and all the unit vectors had have, let's say, norm one for simplicity. And then you say it's a Banach space. So then you can take any L1 sequence of numbers and you can say C1 times first unit vector, C2 un second unit vector. You just write the sequence as a sum of its units vectors. Okay, clearly every L1 function is inside. And that's actually L1 on the integers is a zero of this. So you just take the smallest sequence space not among all the sequence spaces which have reasonable norm, but where you can move the translation and where unit vectors have the same norm or, or uniformly bounded norm, then it must contain L1. And that's, so to say, something which was possible in this mo more general situation. Now, I'm not sure what kind of slides I will have next, but yeah, maybe uh, I mention that's now a, a little bit uh, quite general things, uh, but I think we will not go into all the details later, so I, I think it makes sense. So uh, the a zero space turns out to be a member of a whole family of spaces, which I have called modulation spaces. That has to do with the fact that one way of describing the short-term Fourier transform is to, to, to write it as a convolution operator with a modulated Gauss function. So that's another point. And that, so this. How is the riemann lebesgue lemma, which says if I'm ex uh, exciting an object with a highly oscillating input signal, and we know it will decay to zero, how can I quantify it? And it's plausible that a smooth function, 
uh, which mean a robust object, if I try to do vibrations, it will not uh, move very much. If it's something uh, which having a resonance with a high frequency, maybe it's, it's big. So we would say the spectrogram has peaks in certain areas and there are contributions at the high frequencies, therefore the function is rough. So a formal definition of what modulation spaces are with some restriction, I mean people are going beyond the temporal distribution, but I would say if somebody is giving me a decent function space on, on the on phase space or time frequency plane, and that decentness has two aspects. One is uh, it should be a function space that is solid. Uh, this means that if you tell me that you have a function of two variables which is in the space and you have another which is smaller, it should be also in the space and it should be uh, in this, uh, we have a smaller norm. So you can give me an LP space on this, uh, for example, you could give me L1, then I would be happy and I would say, oh yes, you're recalling S0 is one of them. You can say you can give me L2 and I say, oh yes, this is L2 because of Moyal. So if and only if the short-term Fourier transform of a temper distribution is in L2, we have seen the forward direction, but it's also true in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, now I can say, what if they are in LP? And then it turns out you're not getting LP, but you're getting the spaces that I call MP spaces, so modulation spaces with parameter P. Therefore, S0 is kind of M1, and M2 is uh, L2, and S0 prime module space is actually then M infinity. So it's, yeah, that's maybe an interesting aspect. So when you ask, what is the dual space? Uh, it's plausible, uh, I'm not sure if I have it here, but kind of you can always ask, what is the dual of m of y? If you have a function space, somebody ha has read about uh, weighted Lorentz spaces and he says, I can define now a modulation space with respect to a weighted Lorentz space, whatever it is. I check the conditions uh, and I say, well, are the test functions dense? And um, the person would say, yes, the p, q parameters are away from infinity. Shift is continuous, test functions are dense. And I say, okay then I can tell you that the dual space of m, y is just the opposite. You take the temper distribution where this is in the dual space. And then you can say, well, the dual space of a weighted Lorentz space is a weight, uh, weighted space with the inverse of the weight and the dual parameters in this function space. So this is kind of a quite, quite general valid game. Uh, I because I have started to talk about the dual space of S0, I can say, well, if y equal m1, l1, sorry, then we are S0. So L1 is the modulation space, integrability is the game. What is the dual space of integrability? It's L infinity. So we're looking at all the tempered distributions which have a short time Fourier transform which is integrable, sorry, which is bounded. Now, uh, these test functions make the sensor so smooth that you always have uh, not sure, did I press the button? Yeah. Uh, that uh, you get always continuous functions. So we're in L infinity formally, but practically we're in the bounded continuous functions. Uh, uh, and this is really a criterion. So the dual space is among all the temper distributions, the ones which have bounded spectrogram. Uh, what is the norm in S0? You have seen the expression here it was the L1 norm. What will be the norm of the dual space? You choose L infinity, you take the sup norm. Now, something we have to come back, but not today probably, is we are in the dual space then, and there is a form of weak star convergence. So somebody is telling you uniform convergence is norm convergence, but there is another relevant form of convergence which is better, or which is also very important, it's called weak star convergence. What is that in a practical situation, in this situation here? I don't want to disclose it right now, but we will do it to tomorrow probably. Okay, so uh, actually there are these, these other <coughs> examples that here, here I have these examples. Uh, I have not yet done uh, this here, Sobolev space, HS. And of course, here you have as the modulation space where the weight is constant in the time direction and, uh, and uh, uh, growing like Vs is our, our 
uh, China, a Japanese bracket or it's 1 plus x squared to the power s 1 half. So it's the smooth version of the power of absolute of or, or s. So if you have s equals 2, you would say the functions which have a short time spectrogram which is decaying in such a way that if you multiply it with 1 plus omega squared, it's still square integrable, then you are having found that this is a function in the Sobolev space. And you can do two derivatives, each one is leaving uh, order and the remaining is of course something which is roughly speaking of, of in L2. You can change the roles, you can ask what is the Fourier transform of a function of this and that's the next important thing. The Fourier transform is, uh, I hope I have some slide, if not I have to do it tomorrow, is rotation of the spectrogram by 90 degree. So you're saying, well what is the Fourier transform against the time frequency shifted function here? just as a starting point. And then you say, well, I can use Plancherel. The Fourier transform, I, sh I would like to have some function h hat against f hat, because then I use Plancherel and that's the same as f against this. So if I'm giving you a time frequency shifted Gauss function, you should be able to write it as the Fourier transform of something. And of course, it will be a frequency time shifted Gauss function and that you rewrite and so on. So this is the starting point why really rotating the, the um, spectrogram by 90 degree, clearly an isometric mapping from L1 to L1, from LP to LP, s shows you that all these MP spaces that I have not really written up are okay and are fine. Now the family of MSPQ spaces were then kind of a consequence that in between complete abstract generality with these, I don't know, lower weighted Lorentz spaces with weights which I can fabricate in, in many ways which don't have to be separable. Here I have just L2 spaces and separable weights and I can go with P and Q separately and to have it most similar to PS of spaces I was choosing weights exactly in this form. So I have punishing mainly frequency domain and then of course for P equals Q equals 2 I get again the Sobolev space. For S equals zero, so no weight, and P equals Q equals one, I get a zero, and I have the whole family of spaces. One thing which I found quite interesting, I learned actually from Elena Cordero at one of the Isaac conferences was, she was talking about Schubin classes. And Schubin classes have a lot to do with the harmonic oscillator or so. And for us, it's essentially you take L2 in the spectrogram and you multiply with the radial symmetric bump functions. So for example, you multiply with the inverse of one plus x squared plus omega squared with some power. So you're damping in a radial symmetric way. Now uh, there's a nice thing if you multiply a spectrogram with a radial symmetric function, afterwards it maybe it's not a spectrogram, so what you really have to do, you have to apply synthesis and then you take the signal, oops, it was too fast. Yeah, I think I went too fast. <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't, first I, I try to explain. <laughs> uh, so what was, I'm, I'm stuck now. Uh, yeah, m if I multiply with the radial function, uh, and then I have to do synthesis of the spectrogram and then I go back. That, that's really what the operator is doing. So you can describe it as a multiplication operator. Then I'm in the L2 space on, of, of two variables. So I have produced a picture which is not the spectrogram, but the spectrogram is a closed subspace. So somehow I project onto the spectrogram. And so what I'm really doing, I'm doing VG star and then I do VG. Just remember if you have a mapping which maps the Hilbert space into a higher space, then coming back, if I apply it only to the range, u star will bring me back. But if I change the order and I start here, you give me some vector in R3, I move it here, and then I move it back, I actually get the projection. Because if, uh, what was it? If u combined with u star is identity, if I have u star with u, u star with u, the inner part can be cancelled, so it's a projection operator, it's self-adjoint, and therefore it must have a range, and that's exactly the, the subspace which corresponds to the range of my embedding operator. So operators which have the property that they have a one-sided inverse, uh, which is the identity, are perfect operators where you see 
is an embedding from a small space to a big space. In our case, from arbitrary signals to valid spectrograms. And if somebody destroys a spectrogram, for example, by purposely multiplying it with a radial symmetric function, he gets something which is not a spectrogram, but you can make an operator back by making the valid spectrogram, which is the best, the nearest spectrogram nearby. And that, again, is a one-to-one -one correspondence to a signal. And that's the operator that you define. So again, operator, in short, is take the function, make a spectrogram, multiply it, take VG star after the manipulation, and go back. That's defined on the small Hilbert space. That's the kind of operator that I have. And these operators turn out to be Hermit multiplier. So have the characteristic of, of, of a radial symmetric pattern. We can look later on what the properties of Hermit functions are in the time frequency picture, not now, of course. And uh, so somehow, I think there's a very interesting connection between Hermit expansion and time frequency stuff. So, so maybe here I have. Uh, that was the Schubin class. Yeah, sorry, the Schubin class was. Sorry, thank you. The Schubin class was now. If I do this multiplication and increase the parameter s, then uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I can find it now. Yeah, here it was. Uh, I can either say I'm putting a weight, a radial symmetric weight, on the time frequency plane. That's then another weighted function space. It's not described by taking one LP norm in that direction and LQ norm in another direction. But I still view it as, an as a modulation space, because Y is a L2 function on R2D with a radial symmetric weight. And these are the Schubin classes. But because the radial symmetric weight can be described by a combined time decay and frequency decay, and there's an equivalence of a tensor product weight of polynomial type with a radial symmetric weight, you can also say it's just a Sobolev space intersected with an L2 space. And that was in my original picture in the first lecture. This ellipse times this ellipse. And so the, the kind of the intersection of these two ellipses is also a space in my family, <laughs> if you want. Now I think I can go quickly with these words as just some things. So I think I have mentioned most of the properties in these slides. I was telling you that time frequency shifts are invariant, uh, that it's Fourier invariant, and that it's the smallest guy in the family. Yes, and maybe because to, to, to connect it with yesterday's explanation, I've told our also amalgams in the first part of the, the first lecture today, you can also describe the space as an amalgam space where locally you take the Fourier algebra and globally L1. And you can imagine global L1 means if I know what all these atoms do, you understand what the space is. So uh, what, what does this symbol mean? I have to take a partition of unity, and I take a function which is local in the Fourier algebra and, and check the norm and go on. Now, in the very first paper, my idea was I have something which is in the Fourier algebra locally, so if I restrict it, there is some other function, there is some function which is globally defined, which on this segment looks like this. So I have a piece of a function. And then I measure it in the norm. What is the norm? Well, there are many continuations, and I take the infimum over all the FL1 norms which are here. And then I go to the next one, and I do the same thing, and I do the same thing. You can imagine it's not good to work with equivalence classes of functions which are having some continuation because you cannot glue them together. And that's where also this idea of Bupu really, really came, became prominent. You take just one clear representative. It's not exactly under the boundary, but you glue it together so that if you take this and this and this, you just measure in the FL1 norm. Because, I mean, if something is in the L FL1s locally for every, over every interval, then I can multiply it with another function in the Fourier algebra. We need it's a pointless algebra. So what are the things that are for sure elements in the Fourier algebra and make a partition of unity? You could say I would like to take cubic splines or so, but I say it's enough that you take trapezoidal function. And that was really what Wiener was using. So he was using a trapezoidal function, which are convolution product of a big rectangle with a small rectangle. What does it mean? You have a continuous function. You would say L2 with L2 is continuous. It's true. Go to the free transform side. Big rectangle function is a sink function. Small rectangle function is a stretched sink function. Well, it doesn't matter. It's still both are decaying like 1 over x squared. 1 a little bit slower. But roughly speaking, on the Fourier transform side, 
this, so in the, if you do it with equal size of plateau and, and boundary, you would say, I'm starting from this, which is actually the difference between a big triangle taking away the head, the upper part, and you also have a plateau function. And that's what Mr. Vallée, de la, de la Vallée Poussin was ma making. So he would say, I try kernels which are not saying like this multiple Cesarosome ability, which build up and, and give the uh, Feyer kernel in, in classical terminology, we would say, you multiply with the triangular function, you stretch the triangular function. Now you take these plateau functions, but in all these cases, on the other side, they are in the Fourier algebra. So my thing is, Tabet's functions are easily constructed such they make a partition of unity. I want to have from the pieces everything, but I want to not destroy the local structure because if I have some nasty partition of unity, maybe I'm thinking I would like to have local C3 norm, three different differentials, and I cut away. I mean, I have a jump function, I cannot even measure it. So kind of, I want the measurement should, the device should respect the smoothness of the original function. And I do this, I measure it, and if it's absolutely convergent, then I'm, I'm, I realize that it's in the function. And uh, so I think it's already more than time to go like this. Uh, I will try to show you, for example, properties like this, that if you take, I call them now distribution, if you take a distribution and you smooth it, you get a smooth function, which is good enough such that if you multiply with the test function, you get a, a test function. So that will be our way uh, of a, like bounded measures are approximated by test functions. So the nice objects are approximating the general objects. But you can also say, no, I, I have something which is badly decaying and make it more concentrated on the tight set. And then it's some nasty distribution, maybe still some Dirac's, but then I smooth it out and I also get test functions. So this is exactly, you can leave out the zero, then you have a valid statement for the Schwartz space. And these are statements that are quite useful. So essentially, we have a form of approximation <coughs> of all general elements and if we know how to handle the good elements, well, we know because we know what we do with the atoms, so that's kind of this multiple reduction. So if we know what atoms can do for you, then we can put it together. We use this kind of approximation, which of course weak star approximation within S0 prime, and you will see it's, since you have seen now weak star already m more than enough, uh, it will be quite natural for you to use it. So. I think this, this could, should be the aspects for tomorrow's lecture to, to show you more of these things and how you can use it uh, and so on. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>